Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's not Sunday. It's not a live session. But uh, since we are sort of in the holiday season here, I thought I'd try something a little bit different. Uh, so first of all, a uh, very happy holidays and a Merry Christmas to everyone. Um, the idea for this session or recording came as I was just uh, talking to various other investors, uh, having some chats on Twitter spaces. And just in general, I think a lot of oil and gas investors are looking for some of the more in-field information, uh, a lot of curiosity as to how things actually happen uh, in the oil field. And uh, I was I was thinking about it, and I remembered that about two years ago, when I was actually operating wells in the uh, Grand Prairie area in, in northern Alberta, um, I had this side-by-side -side unit that uh, I would take around the field on some of the more muddy days when the truck just just wouldn't do well or you were uh, really putting a lot of miles on on the uh, a truck taking it out in in literally swamp land um, and one of the things that uh, when I bought this uh, ATV unit was um, that it had a GoPro installed so uh, just just so happened to be uh, so I put a little uh, SD card in there and ended up recording I don't know three three or four of the days or maybe a week that I was out there and thankfully I uh, still had one of the videos so I um, just thought I'd do kind of a little narration on top of that explaining things uh, that we see in the oil field that's about uh, what is it a 15 minute video or some so um, yeah we'll just share some information talk about my experience uh, in the oil field uh, in general while we do a bit of the driving, and then as we get to the sites in the video, I'll uh, share a bit more about, about what the sites are, what they do, and then how they kind of relate back to investments. Um, so yeah, enjoy. Okay, um, so we are starting this off, I believe, at uh, one of these sites here uh, where we had three wells. So a bit of background on, on where we are here. So it's about uh, an hour southwest of Grand Prix. This is the modern resources Wapiti field uh, is where we are. And um, about 1500 BOEs per day is, is what we used to produce between two runs. So we had a Wapiti battery run and then a Wapiti field run. Uh, the battery run was more of the newer wells. So uh, some of the pad development, we had four, five, six, eight wells on, on a pad uh, that would all feed through one pipeline into the main, what we call the battery, uh, which is our central processing. It separates the oil and the water um, and then also it's it's where the, the trucking operation would happen. So we would physically ship out the oil and then the water from that. Uh, the run that I was I was operating and doing a bit of, a bit of the fuel engineering on uh, where we see here, and, and this date is not correct. So uh, we're, we're actually in the summer of 2020 here. Um, and uh, one of the things with the, uh, uh, the Wapiti field run was a lot of the wells were, were older wells. So they were these, these wells way in the bush, as you can sort of see here and uh, very rough terrain. A lot of them were maybe single well batteries. Uh, they were one or two old wells that made very little production. So um, really, you know, a lot, a lot of the wells in Alberta and Saskatchewan are, are like this. Uh, the, the new clean pads with, with multi-wells and looking very sharp and very uh, 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 consistent are, are the newer developments. So call it five, seven, 10 years ago, mostly in the last three to five years. A lot of the legacy production across, across the Western Canadian basin is is like this, uh, which creates an interesting operating environment because a lot of these wells, when when prices go down, they don't really generate that much money. They're high operating cost wells, as you see the kind of roads that you have to maintain. Uh, because this this site that we just came from was a truck site, so as opposed to having one battery, each site has its own trucking in a lot of cases. So the roads need to be maintained, not just for me and the operators and and everybody else to get on site, but for these massive semi trucks that are going to be carrying somewhere between 150 and 200 barrels a day into locations. So a uh, high OPEX, when prices are low, a lot of these things get ignored. People don't spend the right amount of money uh, keeping some, uh, things in check and uh, maybe to, to tie it back to investments. One of the things that I find really interesting is uh, certain companies have hundreds, sometimes thousands of these wells sitting around uh, with, with not the right amount of care and maintenance and optimization being done uh, creates a lot of opportunity. Uh, especially in smaller companies where where the production add, uh, especially if the overall oil price environment is is constructive, uh, can be can be quite game changing without having to drill any wells, without having to spend any money on capex, uh, without building any facilities. Uh, 
you can sort of see here where the road has has gone chewed up uh, as semi trucks have been trying to come up this hill, uh, especially during some of the uh, poorer weather times, and have just chewed up the road here uh, very very bad. This is the kind of things that that uh, half ton trucks are going to get stuck in. They're going to be spinning the wheels and and causing problems. So, um, you know, one one of the uh, I guess joys of operating out there, um, both you you get a real uh, understanding and and really uh, support for the guys out there doing the guys and gals out there doing this sort of work. I mean, the winter is itself brutal, and then in the summer you're dealing with this muggy uh, sort of swampland that you're operating on. So, um, you know, a, a real appreciation of of sort of what it takes out there to keep some of these wells running. Uh, we we as investors, especially in some of the junior companies. We just look at the quarterly reports and we say, oh, the production dropped 3% or dropped 100 barrels. Well, this is what's what's really happening out there. There's people dealing day in, day out, 24-7, uh, uh, trying to keep these walls running and not, not to portray them as martyrs or anything because they are getting paid uh, very handsomely to do this sort of work. You see that a lot of these roads were, were actually legacy logging roads. Uh, you see that big stockpile on the right there where a lumber company has, uh, has cut down their allocation of trees and they just left, just left it there for whenever the market conditions uh, dictate, they can then bring in their logging trucks and, and pull this uh, equipment out. Uh, all these roads are radio controlled. So every single road you saw there where I turned into the roads, each road has its own radio frequency on the, uh, what is what is commonly known as the CB radio, the citizen's band. Um, so, so each road is well controlled uh, because there are a lot of blind spots on these roads. There are situations where there's a big a truck blocking the way and you literally are not going to be able to pass the road. So all, all that information is being relayed on the channel. Uh, we call out every kilometer as we go so that people know, is there somebody coming into the road? Is there somebody exiting the road? And, and there's these, these, these wide points in the road where if you're a smaller vehicle, uh, you just park there, wait for the other traffic to pass you by, uh, and then you continue on your journey. So um, you know, here we are coming up to our 11 of 25 compressor station. On the left here, you see the road that cuts off. That is a shortcut road that Husky used to use, uh, Husky and Synovus. And uh, the interesting thing was we couldn't use it when, when it was muddy out because uh, the road was just such a poor condition road uh, that, that it could only be used when the road was absolutely dry. Uh, otherwise, you risk permanently damaging the road. Um, so yeah, there, there are a bit of shortcuts, uh, uh, shortcuts out there. There's all kinds of roads and ways you can save time uh, when it comes to emergency situations, knowing your area you operate in. Is, is very, very important. Um, and one of the reasons I'm on this ATV to begin with is because the, the, the way that I was checking my 20 or 30 wells every day, if I was to do it in the truck, um, not only would I ruin the truck and ruin the roads, I would be spending two to three hours more driving because I would have to drive around a lot of the valleys and other things here, um, other, other nature geographies, uh, which you will see, uh, we've cut through the bush and, and make our way there. Um, I'll just pause the video here because on this particular day, I didn't spend that much time um, here where I'm discussing, maybe I'll just move it back a bit uh, so we can go through some of the things here happening. So here we have our water tank. Oh, what happened here? So back a bit. Um, yeah, so here we have our water tank here. So any compressor, even if it's, even if your field is producing completely what they call dry gas, which means there's no liquids, there's no water in there, it still produces water and liquids. Uh, it is just a a little physics chemistry thing where if you if you bring gas to different temperatures and you bring gas to different pressures, uh, different kinds of liquids are going to drop out out of that. So we always have a water tank slash excess uh, fluids tank that we used to use. Uh, so everything that's coming onto site, any sort of excess liquid gets put into this tank. When we have about thirty cubes, which is the one cube is six point two nine barrels roughly. Um, when we get that sort of volume in the tank, as you can kind of see by this gauge here, this gauge is literally a ball that sits that sits on top of your liquid. Um, as your liquid goes higher, it pushes the gauge down. So we know exactly when there's about 180 barrels in the tank, so we call up the truck, uh, whether it's the next day or the day after, wait for the roads to get better, and then they'll come in and uh, actually get the liquids out. Um, this here is our... Uh, MCC building, so what we would call our motor control building, all our electrical panels, all our controls in terms of the screens that that show you the live readings on this compressor station are going to be here. Um, any sort of other equipment where you're you have physical trackers as to temperature, pressure, 
all of that will be in here. Uh, these buildings are classified according to their class. So they have class and the division. Um, this one, um, and I'm I'm sort of losing some of my uh, uh, a historical knowledge here, given we're about three years past this. Uh, but I believe this one would be a class one div one building. So extremely secure. They don't want any sparks in this building. We don't need any sort of fire risk. We don't need any uh, any sort of things like that. So even the light bulbs in this building, any uh, 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 heaters in this building have to be that class one div one specification. Um, and a lot of money is being made in, in terms of deploying this equipment. Uh, you see here, we're running solar panels. So one of the things that modern resources did uh, really, really well is, is very upfront, state of the art uh, solar panel work was being done. So we'd have a panels and then we'd have a big bank of batteries that effectively would run all our instruments. We were not using pneumatics at a lot of the sites, uh, pneumatics being instruments that would emit methane every time they cycled. So, um, you know, when it comes to the oil industry, some of the stuff that we're doing is, is well in advance uh, of any government body uh, dictating us or telling us what to do. Some of these things just make economic sense. Some of them may not make economic sense, but they make operational sense. If I'm having uh, a very uh, water-rich fuel gas system that's constantly plugging up these pneumatics, it just makes sense to go to solar. Not, not saying that solar doesn't have its own issues, um, but, but it gives you that runtime you require uh, especially in areas like this, where we're literally, there's nothing blocking you. There's no pollution in the air. Um, it's wide open sunshine. You have long days in the summer. Um, even in the winter, if you had one or two sunny days, it could keep that power bank fired up for four to five days. So, you know, not, not the worst uh, case scenario to be in. This here is a little chemical tank. And these two are where we have, uh, one of them is a storage building. Um, and the other one is our diesel generator. So, we would use diesel generators that would provide power um, along with this. So the solar was being used for the instruments, but in terms of running the actual, some of these bigger light fixtures, um, running some of the other heat tracing on site, we needed an actual diesel generator. So, so the diesel gen would power um, all, all the other uh, electrical requirements on site. The uh, diesel generator is, is not much different than your, um, I should say I should say this. It's a diesel generator converted to using natural gas. So we would actually consume our natural gas. There's a royalty credit you can get from actually consuming the gas that you have produced. Um, and uh, these these are not much different than the five three engines you would see in uh, uh, in any sort of half ton truck or three quarter ton truck. Uh, very similar engine tuned so that it's staying in a stationary position and feeding power more electrically as opposed to a kinetic power. Um, so yeah, that that is the um, diesel engine there. There's a bunch of waste bins. Again, this business has made millions and millions of dollars. Like the simplest thing, collecting garbage off oil and gas sites. Nobody wants to do it. But we used to pay a lot of money just to have these, these sit here a monthly rental fee, and then we used to have uh, to pay them to also take the garbage out when the bin got full. So very simple business. You're just literally putting bins everywhere and collecting garbage. So, um, you know, one of the things about the oil industry that that is really, uh, to me, fascinating is, is once you get to know it, there's so much business to be done, which hasn't properly been optimized or, or, or capitalized on yet. Um, that the opportunities really are endless, especially right now, uh, given some of the new technology, some of the new software, uh, some of the more um, sort of un, uh, undercapitalized, ignored sites that are now going to be firing back up in a in a bullish cycle. There's a lot of business to be done in various parts of the industry. This is not just we either produce the oil or we refine the oil. It's it's there's various R compressor station. Uh, can't remember exactly what brand of compressor we had in here. It was, I, I want to say it was a Waksha uh, unit or a Caterpillar unit. And we could do about 150 decks here. So 150 E3 M3 of gas uh, processing at max, uh, which correlates back to about five MMCF per day, million standard cubic feet per day. Uh, very, very nice unit. This thing ran uh, quite good. As you can see, it is a remote-ish site. Um, so... Uh, very, very important to keep things with the right maintenance schedules. When you have a good day, some good weather, you want to make sure you get all your 
uh, maintenance requirements, fill up all your oils, your, your compressor oil, your engine oil, uh, clear out any liquids in system. Uh, here's our oil barrels. So we would physically pump oil out of this into the engine. Uh, and this is not your standard engine. This is like the whole building is, is literally one engine. So the oil tank for it would be up here, like this massive rectangular container that also has a depth to it. Uh, so picture it in 3D and the whole thing would be filled with oil. So that gave us two to three to four weeks in certain uh, situations that if, if the weather got really bad, you were not able to get trucks into site. Uh, we, we had a lot of uh, oil storage uh, capacity to keep the unit running. Um, of course, this is our exhaust stack here. One of the uh, ones that's being targeted by a lot of companies for emissions reduction. So they can literally pull uh, all the contaminants out of here. Uh, certain companies can actually pull the CO2 specifically and then and then get carbon credits for that uh, along with the other emissions. So um, yeah, nice little unit, ran fine. Um, I got lots of uh, calls on this unit because the unit was being fed by plunger wells. So I will talk about plunger wells when we get to the next site. Uh, but the way that a plunger well functions, it kicks on and then it kicks off. And that movement in pressure and volume can throw these compressors out of whack. We we ran these with, with a little bit of safety net on them because you would rather run something at 95% of max than 100% of max and have way better runtime on it at that lower, lower running environment. Uh, one of the reasons that you see a lot of refineries having incidents, you see food processing plants have incidents, is because they're being forced to run at 100% capacity. Equipment is not meant to run at that for long periods of time. You, you need a bit of a safety buffer in there. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that's gonna come to more and more mind here, uh, because we are running some of our oil processing equipment, um, even on the smaller, more, more localized scale at much higher levels than it should be running at. So um, I guess a little explanation on that and as a background. Uh, here we have the fan cooler. So basically, literally like a, a fan that's spin cold. Uh, we would adjust these fan angles in the winter or the summer, depending on how much air we wanted to go into the compressor. We don't want minus 45 air being blasted into your engine uh, as it's trying to run. So uh, sort of a uh, very dynamic system. The oil patch is not something you just, you just produce oil and it's going to produce forever. Well, other than the decline rates on the well itself, there's adjustments you have to make on the processing side uh, to keep things running up to snuff. And, and you know, when we talk about the labor shortage in the oil field, it's not that that there's a physical shortage of like exact people. Yes, that, that also exists. But the actual experience of knowing where to run your processing equipment, how to optimize so you're getting maximum flow, um, how to optimize so you're not getting these, these fluctuations in pressure and, and uh, flow, uh, keeping things at a 99.9 .9 plus percent runtime, this is the real experience that we're missing. And there's no way to get these people trained unless they actually start right at the lower um, sort of labor force or, or come in with a, with a very strong uh, willingness to learn. So um, this is one of the things that's going to really be important going forward. Uh, I believe uh, one, one of the key, key metrics, if somebody wants a very, I'm not going to say stable because the oil patch is never stable, but if somebody wants a very important skill that's going to be in use for the next uh, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, this is something that's that's really hard to replicate. It's really hard to learn on the internet. It's really hard to learn over textbooks. You have to literally do it and be exposed to certain situations happening, have your problem solving skills and critical thinking come out, try and solve the problem. And then you know, you know how to fix it if it happens in the future you know how to mitigate it so it doesn't happen in the first place. Um, so just a bit of bit of more on the employment section. Uh, this is our separator building, uh, this one right here. So everything, uh, I wonder if we get a view of the pipeline here, but everything from multiple paths, uh, sort of cylindrical vessel, you would separate out the water, put the water in the water tank, as we discussed earlier. Uh, some of the other liquids that are coming in would also go to the tank because we don't have a specialized oil tank on this site. And then the gas, comes in and gets fed into the compression system where it's pressed to a higher pressure. It's put into another pipeline that then goes to a bigger compressor and another bigger compressor. And then they eventually end up at some sort of system where they're then piped individually uh, to each and every one of your homes. Uh, if you're in Alberta, it's minus, uh, it's minus 45 or something right now. This is literally um, where, where the system starts. So 
Um, let's see, yeah, I think we might get a, a glimpse of the pipelines here. So there's about six or seven pipelines coming out of the ground. You, you can kind of see them underneath this tank here. There's one right there. There's a second one right there. And each of them would bring in production from separate pads. Uh, some pads had pump jacks, some pads had free flowing wells. It would all come in here to one gathering point. And if there was any problem in the system where you saw a sudden pressure drop or a sudden flow increase, we would track all of that. We had manual gauges, and then we had what we call SCADA systems, um, data acquisition systems, which would feed data in real time to our, our, our monitoring screen. And, and I unfortunately uh, don't have access to the monitoring screen anymore, but it was literally like a video game. Like you were playing this video game. I had my, my pads showing up here, my compressor here. I could see the flow, what the temperatures are, what the pressures are, what the flow is, uh, what's happening with the liquids dumping. So, um, yeah. You know, that way, it's a very it's a very simplified system. A lot of people have these days. They they literally have uh, everything connected electronically, so we can we can not only keep a close eye as to what's happening, um, but but we could actually see the problems as they occur and react twenty four seven. Uh, you know, I'll I'll reiterate this: the oil and gas is twenty four seven industry. There is no such thing as Christmas. There is no such thing as your birthday. There's no such thing as I have a party to go to tonight. It runs 24 seven, 365. Um, and there's lots of pros to that. There's lots of cons to that. Uh, but you can kind of see the pipeline here. We also had a, what was it? I think it was an injection well here in the back. So uh, you can just see this building right here. This is an injection disposal well. So if we had too much water that we couldn't deal with, we could literally inject it down hole. Um, if, you, if you've been following some of my posting on the Permian and the seismic activity, uh, you know, this is sort of the culprit. When you, when you inject a little bit of volume, no problem. Mother Nature will take it uh, without any issues. But when you start jamming multi-million barrels of, of water per day, that's when the problem starts. So, so a lot of the things in the oil industry are about moderation. You, you can do a lot of things, uh, inject, produce, uh, change up equipment, change up different metrics and parameters, but everything within reason. And you have to make changes slowly. Can't just come in and, and suddenly say, oh, we're injecting five barrels today. Now we're gonna inject 50,000 barrels tomorrow. It doesn't quite work like that. Nature nature works on a very, very slow scale. And what is oil production? You're, you're literally producing from nature. So uh, these things work on a very long time period. Um, and, and I think, uh, one of the things that's that's catching the industry off guard is this mad rush to produce shale at these maximum rates and 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 get your water injection like uh, just massively increase the rate of water injection. It it doesn't it just doesn't work. Uh, physics, chemistry, science, uh, all sort of get in the way. So another reason why I like these older wells, there's a lot more optimization there to be done, and we have the time if the structure of bull market. Uh, is with us as an investor. I love when the C-suite or the engineer comes in and says, hey, I just spent three days in the field, uh, you know, looking at uh, X, Y, Z well, and we think we can do, you know, these things. Instead of the C-suite or the engineer always talking about, look at our new wells, look at our drilling inventory, look at our acreage, like, I get it, but I got to spend money to extract that acreage. These wells and fields are already on production. I mean, you sort of see that reflected in the way that I invest in my portfolio positioning uh, as well. So, so here we are. You can see where we'll end up right there. This is the four, four of 25 site. There's three plunger wells. If I was to drive here from exactly where we stand here in the ATV, it would take me about, um, call it hour at least in good weather, with the roads being how we see here all junked up. Uh, with the rains, probably hour and a half or even longer. And you'll see how we make the ATV ride in, uh, I'm not exactly sure how long, but but four to five minutes, I think. I can use this as, as your tracker, your time tracker. Um, and we, we basically go into the valley here and we come up. The valley itself is a logging valley. It's very open for us to go into it uh, without uh, running into these huge uh, tree trunks that are literally blocking the way. Uh, at one point, I was trying to run a business case along with my operators, uh, to actually build a, a real road here that can connect these two. But we we eventually ended up realizing, and you'll see here with the angle that we go down into the valley, uh, that the road would just be flooded every time anyway, that we really wanted to use it. So it doesn't make sense, right? You're spending all this money building roads. Uh, one thing I will say, 
that's that's curious is along with the infrastructure and the pipelines not being reflected and the land values not being reflected in a company's share price, I think the whole just like infrastructure position uh, of everything is is not being taken into account. The cost it takes to build all these roads, maintain them, uh, keep them up to good shape. Paramount just sold, I believe, uh, 60 kilometers or something of roads uh, they announced for 40, 50, 60 million dollars. So the roads itself have have a cost to it. We we have to pay a tolling charge uh, per day, per month, per year for every single road we use, depending on how many how many of our people are going ahead and using that road. And you see see the angle here going down. This entire thing would just be flooded every time there's rain. You see the old logging sort of legacy is is not just the cost of maintaining them. We had safety twenty uh, no not twenty four seven. We had safety for all all sun sun hours of the day on these roads, tracking how fast are people going, uh, how many people are using the roads, uh, make sure there's no incidents. The the safety watch or the security watch would have first aid kits. They would have tow chains. They would have uh, radios. They would have extra of 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 everything to make sure people are safe here. Um, they were the one known entity that would sort of be there all the time because we had very little cell service out here, like almost zero. And forget about data. You had no data. There was no tracking what's going on with your uh, Sonova stock. Uh, you had to go to the main batteries in order to get really good signal on that. Um, out here in the bush, it was nothing except your CB radio, which you could use in emergency situations to communicate uh, with, with the other users. Keep in mind, it has a distance range. So depending on which radio you bought, you would have a range that people could hear you. And depending on the channel you were on, um, each road had its own channel. So they weren't getting mixed up with uh, sort of the other uh, uh, channels out there. So as you can see, pure bush, pure bush. When when I tell people that that we were literally operating in a jungle, um, and you know, people say, well, there's no jungles in Canada. Yes, I, I know there's no jungles in Canada, but when you, when you send somebody this video, you are in the bush and there are coyotes, there are lynx, there are grizzly bears, there's black bears, uh, there, there's all kinds of wildlife, uh, even the non-dangerous ones here. So um, maybe jungle is not the right terminology, but but you are in, in the bush, in the forest. Um, you know, this, this, this ATV ride down here was one of my most, um, not to say like scareful rides, but the one where, where incidents could happen. You could have a coyote sitting here somewhere uh, just having an afternoon siesta, and all of a sudden you you come in here worrying your engine bah, and uh, you know disturb them. They might have their their kids there, uh, the baby coyotes. So um, you know one of the more more chances where where incidents could happen as as we knock down this entire tree here, uh, unfortunately, uh, to get where we want. This this unit was was a pretty pretty you know brutal unit that I was driving here. It it was a, a single seater side by side uh, Polaris Ace nine hundred. Um, yes, 900 cc in this tiny little thing, and uh, we would go. I I had all kinds of equipment on this on this uh, unit. I had my radio on here. Uh, I had all sorts of engine oil and other uh, maintenance tools. Um, I had a I had a I don't know how much I paid for this. Like I bought this this crazy hunting spear uh, somewhere online. That uh, hey, a spear is not going to protect you against a grizzly bear, but but you know if, if something small tried to come at you. Um, you could at least at least have something with you. Um, these these things are all hypotheticals anyway. Um, and and some people would carry guns. Uh, the other part of the modern resources field, just a tiny bit south here, about ten miles south of here, uh, was grizzly bear territory. This is the Kakwa. Uh, what is it called? The uh, not Kakwa. It's it's the area that Whitecap just bought off XTO. So a uh, sort of cut pick um, links. Yeah, Kakwa. You could throw Kakwa in there big Monty development area and it happens to be in the regional protected area where yeah some of those guys that I used to work with that were further south would see five seven ten grizzly bears a week yeah my field here was a bit more open you see it's not as wooded it's been logged in the past so some of the wildlife don't don't like this sort of territory did I still see lots of wildlife yes have I seen lots of grizzly bears yes Black bears were almost, uh, you know, common, especially in the summertime, and then into the fall time. Uh, but yeah, uh, so so here we are on our four twenty five pad, the one we could see across the valley. Uh, we have three plunger wells, we have three tanks, and we have our little separator building. Uh, you see, the plunger well has no. Here's here's a plunger well. Here's the other one. Uh, 
you can kind of see how they have no pump jack on them. So, so how these are being produced is there's a little, little like um, solid piece of steel that goes down and it sits on this bumper spring, what we call a bumper spring. And what the spring literally is, is it shuts down. The spring will shut down. It will let the reservoir pressure build and build up to some set point that you set it to. And you have this solid piece of steel on top of the bumper spring. Once the pressure has built up to predetermined numbers, which you could run calculations all day long, you could do different sorts of things, but reality was operationally. Operationally, what did the bumper spring want to work at? And what you're trying to do from an engineering perspective is build enough pressure underneath this bumper spring so that when it opens, it would take this solid piece of like, call it 16 inch steel up the well. We had to bring it all the way from the bottom of the well, about call it 1500 meters up into this little red, red piece here. And two things were gonna happen. The gas was gonna push the physical piece of steel up the well, but also as this piece of steel came up, because it was so close to like taking up the entire tubing string in your well, it would literally push liquids up. So the goal was we want to use the gas pressure to keep pushing liquids out of the well without using a pump. Why do we not want to use a pump? Because pumps hate gas. Rubber hates gas. You try and run anything that, that's a steel and rubber equipment and try and use it to compress gas or push gas. It just doesn't work. Rubber and steel like liquids. They like lubricating liquids. Oil happens to be a lubricating liquid. So... Uh, plenty of things happening there on the engineering side. I could talk all day long about how we used to run these models, uh, depending on the water oil ratio, depending on the gas oil ratio, depending on the wax that was forming within these wells. Uh, these wells were on a rigorous maintenance program. Um, not these specifically, but some of the other plunger wells and some of the other free flowing wells. We would have a de-waxing rig in there every three to four days, going in there, cleaning out the tubing of all the wax that had developed. Um, and you can see some on my LinkedIn profile, actually. I, I used to share a lot of information about the field uh, as to uh, some of the incidents that happened, uh, some of the unique situations that occurred. Uh, here you see, we got a, we actually got a swab rig stuck here. So these wells are on rig mats. These are wooden mats here uh, because this, this lease was so prevalent to getting absolutely destroyed by the floods uh, and the rain uh, that, that we actually needed rig matting for even trucks, like half ton trucks to get to uh, on these sites. And what ended up happening was one of the rigs um, ended up falling off the mat into literally swamp. And tires don't want to a, a turn when you're sitting on swamp. So uh, you can kind of see the damage, some of the damage here that's occurred. Um, and the wells itself were, were nice little wells. And to explain it, to bring it back to compression a bit more, when the well started, think about what's happening. You're having this huge slug of high pressure gas and liquid coming into this separator. And then it was getting pipelined out into the compressor we were just at. Now compressor is running along, it's doing its thing. It's got a different kind of suction pressure. It's producing fine. And then well, bam, you, you slam it with this gas and liquids. It needs this adjustment period to operate, like to, to take the slug of gas compress it, and then come back to its normal operating conditions without overpressurizing, without overfilling a liquids uh, area. And that's why the safety net discussion is so important. If I maintain that five, 7% safety net, I could effectively run these plunger wells. If I didn't run it, it would eventually go down because yeah, can it handle one slug of gas? Sure. What if all three wells just over natural time, they all have their own timing. They all kick on at different times. What if all three piled on at the same time? Your compressor would go down if you didn't run a safety net. And, and that's where it comes down to operational um, sort of efficiencies. With a compressor that was as remote as the one we were just at here, I don't want it going down at 2 a.m. and then me having to slog along there in the mud, in the darkness, trying to figure out what was happening. You just don't want to run operations that way unless the facilities have easy access close to where you were. 
where I lived in Grand Prairie, I was an hour away at least from this site or from the compressor site. So we ran things a bit more, more properly, I would say. Uh, some can argue that we weren't maximizing flow. It wasn't about maximizing flow. It's about maximizing your month end production, which relies a lot on runtime. Uh, so I'll stop there on, on that topic. Uh, here we are entering the 425. We had a little, uh, we, we can actually unscrew these red caps and pull that solid piece of steel out, the plunger out of the well, inspect it, make sure it's not getting dinged up because it is literally traveling 1500 meters up and down the tubing, which is pure steel. Um, call it every 20 minutes, every 30 minutes, it is going to get damaged. You have steel on steel impact um, as the thing is coming up the well and going down the well. So that's why we have these ladders here. Uh, we could climb up here, pull the plunger out of this red uh, red cap. Uh, you see your typical wellhead setup. We have our, our uh, casing pipe here at the bottom. Uh, we have our tubing, which, which the tubing takes all the liquids and gas, puts it into the separator building. Um, other side of the valley. So I had wells on both sides of the valley. The Wapiti battery run was on the uh, east side uh, with some of the newer development that was happening with uh, not just uh, not just modern, but white cap, as well as what is now I3 energy, used to be gain energy. Um, there's also a separator building on this uh, pad. What we did in the separator building was, was, was separate the gas and the oil and then the water. And also what we did in the separator building was our testing uh, operations. So each well had to be tested at least once a month. Some of them were, were twice a month. So we could physically take one well at a time and have a second separator that would tell you over a 24 hour period, over a 48 hour period, what exact gas, oil and water was produced from that well. We would then get a one liter sample of liquids. So we would spray, call it five milliliters or 10 milliliters every time the plunger came up. We would spray that into this bottle automatically. And over a hundred runs, we had one liter of oil that was collected. We would then take it to a strength a centrifuge facility, spin it and figure out what is the actual oil water ratio on this well. We would do that for every single well. And then we would take it down just before I go there, I've seen a lot of bears right here, right here in this opening. They love this wooded area. They'll come out and kind of have a, have a good time uh, sleeping or whatever they do. Um, so uh, where was I here? Uh, on the testing facility, yes. So, so what we would do is we would continuously update where is, is our entire oil and water coming from? We don't have real-time knowledge on that. We're using monthly testing to then reallocate back to the wells and our overall field production uh, and, and sort of where it was and what it was doing. If our overall production was coming down 10% and none of the wells went down, we would just allocate that accordingly to all the wells and we could figure out decline rates on the wells over a period of time. We could figure out if there was something going wrong operationally with the wells. Uh, here's what we call a pipeline header. So at certain times, when you have massively long sections of pipeline, you want it coming out of the ground and then back into the ground because it gives you more control. If there was a leak on a 10 kilometer section of pipeline, it's a big nightmare. You're not gonna you're not gonna dig 10 kilometers to figure out what the problem is. If you had this this coming out of the ground every kilometer, you can effectively only have a problem on a one kilometer chunk of pipeline. Um, here is a CNRL battery. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of this right now, but but you can see um, if I just scroll back a bit, you can see the flare stack and how massive this thing is. Uh, as I go, maybe here, let me just run the video. Maybe we'll see it a little bit better here. Uh, right there, you can kind of see the, this orange and white uh, pipe here coming out of the ground. That, that's a flare stack. So they, they keep burning some gas in order to keep the facility going um, in case there's any problems and the facility shuts down. We want to have this flare already going so we can keep production online while the operational problem is fixed. A pretty decently sized facility here. You see the separator, uh, the cylindrical building I was talking about. This is a compressor. We know it because there's an exhaust uh, stack on it. A uh, pretty decently sized unit. They had quite a few operators here. We always want to maintain good connections with our neighbors uh, who are operating in the area. When I look at companies, I look at their management team, I look at their operations. I try and figure out, are they actually good operators in this area? Do people trust them? Are people willing to, in an emergency situation, come and help whatever's happening? These things are very important that are not going to be reflected in any financial statements, in any MDNA, in any sort of uh, Q&A with the CEO. You're not going to find these things out. You need to know people at a field level, uh, which is really, I think, where one of the edge is in resource investing. You can find out really fast whether a company is making up numbers, they don't have good relationships in the area. 
um, sort of what the problems are, and uh, and and not not a good sign. These are decade long relationships that are built over time. These are not just hey, I'm the new guy in the area. Um, you might as well trust me because I've got money. No, it doesn't work like that. There's there's uh, long standing relationships uh, and, and and deals that can be made. Uh, we see these have gates on them because they have cattle that can escape, and we need to keep them within this this, this boundary. Sometimes I'll just pause it here for a sec because a uh, few things to to uh, discuss. Here's the gate again. Um, so a couple of pump jacks. This pump jack is operating. You can see it slowly going up. Uh, every pump jack has an optimized strokes per minute. Uh, so so we run it at that unless there's some operational problems. Um, this pump jack has been converted to a plunger. So you'll see as we go into the site, the wellhead itself is a plunger well. So what happened here? Well, what happened was they installed a pump jack. Then they realized, well, hang on a sec. This well is making way too much gas. We cannot produce it uh, properly with a pump jack. We're burning up pumps. We're causing issues with, with gas locking. So what we're going to do is convert it into a plunger well. Uh, this pump jack used to run fine. Very, very nice, stable producer. It would produce, uh, call it, if I remember correctly, this one used to produce like three to four barrels per day. This plunger well was a nice little safety uh, net because if something went wrong where we lost power on the site, I could use the gas from this well to kind of get the instruments going and then we could get the facility fired up. So a nice little unit here. Behind here is our pipeline coming in. So this pipeline was actually coming in from one of my newest pads. Uh, 30, was it 13 to 21 or 16 to 21 pad? Uh, this is 66 of 8 west of the 6th. If anybody on Petro Ninja wants to go look this up. Um, that was one of my newer pads. It used to make 40, 50, 60 cubes a day. So about two, 300 barrels per day. A very active site here that I had, which is why you'll see here why my ATV is stored on this site. And I have a C can of extra equipment sitting here, given this was the one of the most, most attended site. We didn't check every well every single day. Some of them was relied on pressures, watching our SCADA systems, making sure everything is running. I also had cameras on a few of my sites that could send pictures every four hours and make sure there's no leaks. You know, it could send pictures every hour, every minute. I just had it adjusted um, a certain way. It would text me the picture uh, so I could make sure nothing was wrong. Uh, but the reason I mentioned this pipeline is there's this concept of pigging. And what we do is we send this, this rubber pig, um, not a real pig. Uh, it's a rubber, rubber pig about 10, six to 10 inches long. And it takes up the entire pipeline a radius, uh, the entire pipeline diameter. And we would then push it with pressure to clean up the pipeline. Because think about it, a pipeline has low spots. There is wax clinging onto the side. There might be a water uh, accumulation in certain parts. We would literally push this entire thing, um, and 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 this site, uh, one of twenty-two site, was our collecting point. So the pig would come in here. It would be pushing all this two hundred, three hundred barrels of liquid, and it would go into our our little separator here, and we would produce it into the tank. You cannot learn this on YouTube. You cannot learn this on any textbook. Your petroleum engineering degree is not gonna show you how to bring a pig in when you're having that, that amount of volume of barrels coming in. So to come back to my original point I made on the compressor station, a lot of what the oil industry needs is time. None of these things can just be solved by planting guys in there and putting them into the uh, uh, manufacturing process and just saying, go. There's a lot of thinking here involved. As an investor in, in oil companies, I like talking to the operators more than I like talking to some of the C-suites and some of the engineers because they're running modeling. The operator is dealing with reality um, and, and really excellent conversations. You get a really good idea of, is this field being run properly? And if it is, what are some of the pain points? What are some of the, some of the optimizations that can be done when oil prices go higher? And how much potential do some of these companies really have sitting untapped? You know, somewhere behind pipe, somewhere behind lack of expertise, somewhere behind lack of knowledge, um, and and really make for strong investment thesis um, on those companies. Uh, so here we are coming into our little separator building. Uh, we have our chemical tanks, uh, little pop tanks. So these are used in case of emergency incidents. We can dump fluid into this. Frequently, what would happen is you see this pipeline here. 
this pipeline goes all the way around into my separator. And this pipeline would freeze up. When it's minus 45 out, this pipeline would freeze up. So you could no longer dump liquids into your tank. And if, if we didn't have the right kind of mitigation processes, I didn't have a steam truck already available on site, there were sometimes you just clear out your valves and your piping in there and you dump into the pop tank. Um, you know, the, the oil field has done a really good job at redundancy. It needs it to operate. You know, there's a reason we say 103 million barrels of world oil capacity gets you 100 million barrels of world production because there, there's always something going wrong. There's always production that's going to be offline uh, because that's just a literal nature of the world. The world is not a video game where you can code in XYZ incident is never going to happen. There were some bizarre things that would happen out there where you think, like, how, how, how did this even happen? How did oil end up in this place? Or how did the pressure get to this number? Um, you know, it just doesn't make sense, but that's the reality. You're dealing with uh, huge pressures, huge volumes, huge flows underground that you're trying to produce at surface conditions. Um, so here we are, uh, my little uh, black beauty here. We had uh, a, quite the setup on this unit. Um, so, you know, when, when people say, oh, there's these, uh, trucks, you know, people are driving around for no reason. Uh, yeah. Here's a truck that actually was doing what it needed to do. We had a, a lift on it. We had some, uh, uh, shocks on it. I believe I was using not the Fox 2.0s, but some of the Rancho adjustable shocks here. We had some bigger tires. Um, I had my, my three light bars on the front. You can see I had one in my grill as well, um, for the late night callouts for the late night, any sort of operational problems where we had to stay late. Uh, once again, I will say this, oil and gas is 24 seven, 365. When somebody says they've worked in the oil patch for three years, that means they've worked in, in the oil patch for six years because you're working 250, 300 hour months. Uh, you're being called out on your days off. You're being called in on, on, on other tasks. So it, it doesn't correlate well to somebody working in an office or 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 on something else, it's more it's more like working on a startup, where where you're effectively working way more hours uh, than what your resume shows. Um, I also had four uh, little little light units on the back um, because people love tailgating when it's blowing snow out and you can't see anything, and these lights uh, conveniently had a strobe features, so we could actually strobe people and. Um, yeah, didn't have any tailgating problems uh, after that's, that light was flicked. Uh, I'll just put it that way. Um, so here we are. Here's another garbage bin, as you see, as I was discussing earlier. Some extra equipment. Here's our sea can. Literally the containers that people use to ship stuff from all across the world. Um, we see some spare oil here. Uh, gallons of, of engine oil that could be used. Um, a lot of spare parts stored in this unit. You see a little gas can. Uh, if I, why isn't this going away? Uh, Okay, so anyway, you see a little, little gas can there. There's me uh, all geared up in my fire uh, retardant coveralls. Uh, I'm a little ATV uh, equipment. Uh, but but we used to store about 10 to 15 to 20 liters of gasoline. Every single of these sea cans, I had about four or five of these sites uh, because you never know. You never know when you had to stay late. You couldn't make it back to town to refuel your truck. Um, I, I used to consume somewhere between 40 to 60 liters. Um, that's about 10 to 15 gallons a day of gasoline driving around my field. Uh, keep in mind, you're either in auto four-wheel drive or four-wheel drive a large portion of the day. Uh, you're operating in conditions that are don't 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 correlate to the uh, uh, low friction environments that highways are that give you the high uh, fuel economy. Uh, here's a little fluid shot unit. So uh, I think I'll share share more on these things maybe in a future session. Uh, but a little fluid shot unit. This is our watchdog unit that we used to use. Uh, something that's becoming very prevalent as we go on. Crescent Point, Saturn Oil, I believe Obsidian. A lot of companies are switching to these watchdog units, which is their way of automating some of the operations. Likely this, this, this company is a great one to invest in. Uh, it's private, so, so there's nothing that can be done. Um, but a lot of things in the oil patch are going to become very interesting uh, from the service side. I think as time goes on, as more of these facilities are brought back online, as some of the older wells are reconditioned, um, you know, when people ask about service side investments, I don't care about drilling rigs or service rigs or or whatever else. Like, give me the small item that is a very high margin item and is has a huge customer base, as in it needs to be installed on every site or every second site, right? Like things that have hundreds of thousands of sites they can be applicable to. They're cheap enough that people are going to install them 
and they actually end up increasing operational efficiency. So those are the service companies that I really want to be investing in. Um, and that sort of uh, ends our little tour. So it was a 17-minute journey here, but I think I've been uh, talking here for, for quite a while longer than that. Um, so I think I'll end it there and uh, always open to any comments um, and, and other suggestions on what people like to see. I don't have that much video content, unfortunately, from my time in the patch, uh, but I do have lots of pictures that I've taken uh, of different incidents that occurred. And, um, you know, maybe one of these days we'll, we'll put some pictures up and share why things went wrong, what things can go wrong, uh, what the mitigation factors are as, as sort of a HSE meeting, uh, health, safety, and environmental meeting um, at some point. And I think just, just you know, to for those that are watching this, um, even just, just as a white tundra thing, as, as, it, as it evolves, I think I've shared a lot of my company-specific insights. I've shared a lot of my, uh, call it valuation seminar data. I've shared, I've shared a lot of the macro stuff and all that's still going to continue, but I want to pepper in some of the reality here, you know, some of the things that that I feel I have a unique experience in, um, some of the things that are that are maybe not not readily available out there, and one of them is is my time in in the old patch. I mean, this was a very enjoyable uh, four to five years that I spent uh, in the old patch. As much as you are uh, deserted, you're sort of out there remote. You don't have any set schedule. Um, your life sort of revolves around the oil field and your wells and operations. I think this this is sort of uh, the the back to the basics way of of how the world works. And I I love sharing it. I'm not saying that I'm better than other people because I've done this work or anything like that. It's it's just something that that speaks to me. Um, and I hope if I can if I can really look back, I hope I can find more uh, SD card videos like this because. Um, I like the narration aspect of of going through through uh, going through these things. I discovered that none of these videos ended up recording the audio aspect of it, so it makes it even better uh, for this narration style of video. But uh, I leave it there. Always happy to chat further, and if there's enough interest, if there's people are are enjoying these sorts of things, I'm happy to make more uh, in the new year, and 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 maybe even have some of them as a as a session. Maybe we do a little Sunday session, and then we wrap it up, and then we have a 30 to 45 minute discussion as we run through um, the video and maybe take live questions. Um, you know, who who knows where this is gonna go? We, uh, we're in this new new sort of world uh, here of, um, of both investing and, and just uh, real dollars having to come back into the real industries and information like this. Uh, who knows, may spark some idea that somebody thinks, hey, why don't we do this? And it ends up being, um, you know, something that comes into the oil industry at some point. So thank you for joining me on this journey. I uh, appreciate your time. And uh, we will see you at the next one. Uh, in the meantime, uh, happy holidays, a Merry Christmas. And if there's no other Sunday sessions planned, which uh, I don't think there is going to be anything unless it's super last minute uh, for the rest of the year, a very, very happy new year. Um, and I will see you all uh, sooner or later here. Cheers.